You know, I read this every day. It doesn't say anything about braking. So here we have Nico Ronde, who is our chief instructor at the uh, Sim Raceway School. And we're gonna kinda look at some different things on uh, Formula cars specifically as it relates to Formula One. And luckily here we have our Formula Three cars, we are a, which are a direct relative of Formula One car. This is where most of the Formula One drivers definitely drive these cars along the way on their road to Formula One. So these, this Formula 3 car is about three, four years old. And so the technology aero, et cetera, is very um, relatable to a Formula 1 car. So we're gonna talk about a few things. First off, we're gonna talk about degressive braking. And as Nico always corrects me, not digressive braking, because that's something we do. And we're trying to avoid a, con <laughs> trying to avoid coming around to a point. But uh, so Nico's gonna uh, talk about it. It's a, an essential part of driving a Formula car and Nico has driven many, many Formula cars with lots of aerodynamic advances on them. So he's, uh, he's our guy to explain it all to us. So take it away, Nico. And that's the key, really, to what you just mentioned at the end, aerodynamics. Every car, every car demands some degree of degressive braking. You know, the physics are very simple. The faster you go, the more kinetic load you will have, the more you will transfer load to the front tires, the more braking power you will get. So every car demands some degree of degressive braking. But when you're speaking of an aerodynamic car, all of a sudden that takes another dimension because not only do you have the kinetic energy that increases the square speed, but you also have the downforce. I mean, of course, that's the, the whole key of all the modern um, aerodynamic cars, our no. Formula 3 included. Um, although, as Paul mentioned, it's three or four years old, so it looks good. <laughs> it looks good. There is no step. There is no step. <laughs> We're all talking and joking about the, the rules of Formula 1 that just mandated that everybody's got that nose that is... Uh, an aberration really <laughs> so, <laughs> so when see. you're talking about kinetic energy you're obviously not talking about curves right Nico no no kinetic energy that we're talking about is of course it increases its the celerity so your speed times your mass and of course cars that are lighter have less of that that increase but they'll go also go faster so you know uh, the faster you go the more kinetic energy you have and the more you will transfer it to the front as, as I said, that is the reason why it takes so much more force to stop a car that is going 60 miles an hour than 40. You know, it's not one and a half times, it's more like six times the same, the same force uh, as you go. And there than any car, because they weigh very little, that's the benefit. Our car, even the school, the school trim as it goes with the reinforced spots and everything, weighs 1,250 pounds. Uh, and it makes, according to Lola, 1,500 pounds of downforce at 150 miles an hour. So that gives it tremendous grip, tremendous pressure on the tires. Problem is, when you get on the brakes, and we've seen on the data spikes of just about 3 Gs in D-cell, uh, you get to 3 Gs in D-cell, well, that speed is going down very quickly. And so is that aerodynamic pressure, so is that kinetic energy. If you hold your steady foot pressure, guess what? You now have lockup. That is actually one of the big, uh, big drawbacks of. Uh, we talked about. Uh, was it last year or two years ago? We talked about the left foot, right yeah, foot brake. Two years ago, yeah. That was one of the biggest drawbacks that I pointed out at the time. It's so easy to overlap, and when you are left foot braking, you just go two brakes before the load actually transfers to the front, and now you lock up the front tires. It feels like you're going fast and braking hard when you really aren't. On the other hand, if you don't degress on your brake pedal pressure or you increase it, which is natural, a lot of people talk about having the car take a set. You get on the brakes, let the car take a set. Well, guess what? You just gave up some braking power right there. There is no take a set. I mean, of course there is, but it's so sharp. That's something grandpa does. That's something that a very long travel suspension <laughs> car demands. If that's what grandpa is driving, <laughs> that's what he needs to drive. But basically, it's a, yeah. as long as the car is still in motion, as long as the car has not gotten to that steady uh, uh, pressure, basically the load on the tires is not there yet. It's increasing. That's exactly what the suspension travel is there for, to delay the load transfer. So if you're dealing with a Baja truck that has about this much suspension travel, Yes, you do need to increase the brake pressure slowly to allow the load to get there, the weight to transfer, the load to transfer, 
and to push onto those front tires and then squeeze them hard. How much suspension travel do we have in a Formula car? Not very much. Not very much. Actually, Not very the much. right height, and Timo is in the background, is going to correct me, I'm sure. I think our right height is 22 millimeters. So that's under an inch on the front. And actually, if you were to look very closely at those suspension arms, you see that they're not level with the car. That is what you may have heard of before as anti-dive. It's the same that you will get in the back, anti-squat. But basically, because of this arm, of the A-arm being further up, when you first get the natural rotation that the load transfer would get, it stops the car from nose diving. Those cars actually do not get any nose dive. When you look at them from the outside, the front still goes down, but it's a function of the pivot point around here because the rear is coming up. The rear is coming up, now the front end is coming down. Right. And also so a poor man's reactive ride height is susp active suspension, right? <laughs> you could call it that, yeah. It's a mechanical way of trying to get... Yes, it's, uh, it's anti-dive. It's a very, very good design that every Formula car will have. Mm -hmm. It works. The problem is like it doesn't give you a whole lot of give when you're driving around town, which you don't. No, we tried that. <laughs> we got in trouble for that. You did. Well, yeah, I get in trouble for a lot of things. So, I mean, the basic synopsis is that with an aero car, aero gives you more grip in the tires and aero in grip increases with speed. Speed. Right, yeah. so as the car slows down, that aero grip is going away, so therefore the initial push on the brake pedal you could give it initially at a higher speed because it had so much aero grip adding to the regular mechanical grip of the tire. As that starts to go away, you have to bleed off that brake pressure accordingly so you don't lock up the front tires. Yes, front or rear, yeah. actually, you could even have that because you're losing downforce all over on the car and there is which is why it's exponential yeah. in this particular case and, and and when you do the data analysis with uh, people that come to the school yeah and the, the the things that make their eyes open not only your mid corner speed but how much actual brake pressure pressure you can initially give yes. on these cars because how much pressure do you normally give when you initially input that brake pressure? I mean, the brake pedal pressure is about depressing 110, 120 pounds, but the resulting pressure that you see at the brake pad, which is what the data is measuring, is as high as 850, 160 PSI, depending right. on the weather, because of course that gives you different downforce. Right. Uh, but never less than 650, 680, even when we run on an intermediate tires, mm -hmm. 680. 650, 680 is what you need. And as you were pointing out, we look at the data and our students are getting lockup at 300 PSI because they do it much later in the braking zone. They don't right. do it in what we call our zone one, but they're, are, they are ramping up their pressure and by the time they get to 300 PSI, well, there is no more arrow. Mm -hmm. So they can't utilize it. And it's very much a, a mental switch that you need to make right. because you keep trying, keep trying, and you get locked up. So you feel like you're at the limit, as opposed to you really need to trust the instructors and go hard on the brake, and the thing stops right. or slows down. And then, <laughs> and then you need to, to, to come off the brake pedal as you go. Right. They're, they're braking like they're trying to stop spilling their coffee cup when they initiate the braking, whereas luckily we have no cup holders on our cars. Yeah, very so good. So that's ones. okay. So you can brake as hard as that car can possibly take, yeah. and for the most part, it's as hard as your, your leg can possibly give it initially it depends on your legs but yes <laughs> it depends on your legs, <laughs> it on your legs. <laughs> it's quick, mo more so it's a it's the quickness that is critical pretty much right. every single one of our drivers is strong enough to uh, to use to right. produce that much brake pedal pressure it's how but quickly they don't do it quickly right enough. they have to roll straight from the yes. gas pedal straight to as much pressure as they can give that yep. brake pedal Optimum. and then gradually bleed it off as the speed comes down depending on the corner obviously depends on the rate of how much you come off yeah absolutely i mean optimum velocity optimum transition from full throttle to peak brake pedal pressure is about three tenths of a second and if you do it quicker than that you may still outrun the load transfer although there is no suspension movement as we just talk, talked about well there is still tire compression right and it's about two to three tenths of a second we find that if you go quicker than that 
you then will get the instant lockup at the front. Right. And, and that's why you'll probably see, even on Formula One drivers, when they do make mistakes, they're not getting lockup initially when they get in the braking zone. And the, you'll usually see in the last third of the zone is when they start to see the lockup yes. in the tires. And that obviously, you know, the cars change with the tire degradation. This changes with fuel load. This changes with grip levels maybe changing during a race. And so the drivers are always adapting to that. It's not just one pressure and you do it the same every lap. It's always going to change too. And that's the skill involved is adapting to the conditions of what your car is doing at that point, moment in time. So you'll bleed off of the pressure. May have been great five laps ago, but it has to be completely different now, seeing as your tires have degraded and your fuel load is lighter, etc. Yeah, plus there is also, as soon as you touch the steering wheel, you're shifting load towards the side as well. You know, the signature Lewis Hamilton lockup on the inside, which he had a couple of years, because they always ran that McLaren so stiff, which they still did last year, which is why they was corpusing over all those bumps. It worked for them, they made it work, but it exaggerated his trademark of just going in and inside locking up. And yeah, he's yeah. only locking up one tire, so it's not necessarily because his zone three, as we call it here, is bad. It's just because he's loading the car a little bit earlier. That's A little more aggressive with his turn in than Mr. Yeah. Button. It's still a touch more, and it may choose to set up with a little bit more front bias because of his braking style. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so that that's... Yes, Mr. Button is so smooth when he gets to that. So. There is actually one more reason for the aggressive braking, which is um, what are we doing when we're braking? We're basically dissipating all of that kinetic energy through friction into heat. And you obviously have much better cooling when you're going faster than when you're going slower. So by having degressive braking technique, you actually improve your, your brake wear and know your brake efficiency period altogether so that's again is true for any car and of course even more so no formula one cars typically don't have a whole lot of brake wear issues although red Bull a couple years back which again was uh, or in like, unless felipe mass is driving your car well, right? um, no <laughs> comment there <laughs> but yeah if you if you went back to that um, what year was that that was two years ago right when red bull when Vettel, two or three races in a row, had brake problems, including uh, Melbourne, oh, right. where he yeah the first race of the year, yeah, where Mark Webber was completely fine of brakes all the way throughout throughout the whole race, just a slightly different braking style. He was giving up a touch of speed, yes, but made the car last. All right, all right, folks. Well, there you are. That is Nico explains it all, and um, I'm trying to think up what the next question will be, but I'm sure it'll be good, and I'm sure uh, Nico will be up for the job, right, Nico? Oh, absolutely. Yes. All right. Goodbye.